All right, well, it's 2.01, and so uh, we've got a good group of people, and so let's get it started. I'm Rebecca Schramm, and I'd really like to thank you for joining us today. Um, we're really proud to have Dr. Sylvie with us today uh, to teach us the tools to set us up for success in our learning environment. Um, Dr. Sylvie is a licensed clinical psychologist who has an attitude for gratitude. Uh, Dr. Sylvie, we'd love to hear your pre presentation. Take it away. Awesome. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Um, so today we're going to be talking about science-backed strategies, that means evidence strategies to increase your well-being, I'm mindful also of your families and your work teams, right, and how to build productive habits not only at home personally and also at work. So let's do it. All right, so I'm so grateful to be here. So speaking of attitude of gratitude right off the bat, I thank the BCO organization for inviting me today to help support you, your families, and your work teams as well. Like Rebecca mentioned, I'm Dr. Sylvie. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist working at Body Associates here in Rockville, Maryland. I specialize in treating anxiety and mood disorders, as well as obsessive compulsive disorder or OCD in children as well as adults. I also uh, spent many years in graduate school studying happiness. So I have a background in resilience, happiness research. So the clinical recommendations, oops, sorry about that. The clinical recommendations that I will be providing today are going to have that um, in mind as well. Okay. Uh, a little bit about me before we start. My family is Cuban and I was raised in Puerto Rico and Miami, so I'm a bilingual therapist. That means that English is my second language. <laughs> so sometimes I always tell the families and clients that I work with, I'm going to mess up on words, guys, and I somehow blend metaphors a lot and I'm always learning. So please be patient with me. Just one of the wonderful things about being a bilingual person. Uh, our talk today is gonna be about 45 minutes and I wanna leave ample time for questions at the end. Um, and I also want you to be mindful that you will receive this presentation as well as a big uh, chunk of resources at the end of things we talk about so that you have those resources with you at home. Let's do it. So today's topics are how to create work and learning habits for optimal productivity and increased motivation. Uh, I'm gonna talk about my favorite topic, positive emotions, uh, the importance of them, what are some benefits that they have to us and how to have this attitude of gratitude that's so protective for us, our families and our work teams and how to increase hope, especially around times that are uncertain, like we were talking about a little bit earlier, this waiting period, having hope is incredibly protective for our mental health and also for our productivity um, and work settings. Then finally, I will talk about self-care, that buzzword that we keep hearing about, uh, healthy habits, what kind of healthy habits are helpful to have, and then how to make them stick because consistency is really the game changer here, right? One healthy habit once is not going to give us the reward and return on that investment. So I'm going to teach you what I call biohacks and um, brain hacks on how to make these good habits stick for you. Okay, so let's talk about productivity. When we're thinking about productivity, I think it's really helpful to also consider the other P word, which is procrastination. <laughs> this comes up a lot with the people I work with, with myself, with ourselves. Procrastination seems to me, seems to be like the arch nemesis of productivity, right? So we have to talk about each one and especially I wanna give you resources on how to reduce procrastination in order for our productive habits and good habits to continue over time. So Pierce Steele, which is one of the world's foremost researchers and speakers on the science of motivation and procrastination, describes an equation that's useful in understanding procrastination tendencies in ourselves. Right? So the formula for motivation is expectancy times value is divided by impulsiveness times delay. 
Uh, this is a geeky formula. I'm really into geeky things and we will break it down. It's pretty simple. And all the strategies that I'm gonna give you are uh, in order to address this research-based formula and how to get motiva motivation working for you. So motivation, the willingness to do work, which is essentially the opposite of procrastination. So let's break down the equation further. Expectancy refers how much you expect to succeed at completing a task at hand and getting the anticipated reward from it. The more you expect being successful, the less likely you're going to procrastinate. Value refers to how much you enjoy doing the task and how much you're going to enjoy the reward. The more value you derive from the task or the reward, the more likely you're going to go straight to work. This is something that's important to me. Let's do this. Let's get this done. Impulsiveness <laughs> refers to our tendency to get distracted by other things. Gosh, high impulsivity lures us to other sites, Instagram, Facebook, Netflix, uh, our adorable dogs, our cats, our kids, instead of doing the work at hand. Delay refers to the time between your work and receiving the anticipated reward. So the longer the delay, the more likely you are to procrastinate, meaning you figure, okay, this is something I can do later. I don't have to do it right now. There's no sense of urgency. The delay is there. Right. So here's the goal after understanding this equation. My goal is to help you maximize expectancy and value as they are directly proportional to motivation and minimize impulsiveness and delay as those are inversely proportional. Okay. So now let's go through actionable evidence based steps on how to use this equation to your advantage. Okay. First, procrastination hack that I want you to have in your toolbox is that we need to break down the steps of any project or any task that's at, at hand. With any task you need to do, whether it's a report for work or helping your children with their homework or organizing something with your work team, breaking it down into smaller steps increases expectancy as smaller tasks seem much easier to accomplish than a bigger project. Everyone has a different sweet spot for this. So I find that being hyper-specific with timelines is helpful for me. For example, if I have a project, just like this presentation, I gave myself daily small goals to identify the topics I wanted to cover, pick the slight aesthetic, which is something that's incredibly important to me guys for some reason, and then tackling one topic per day. It made it more digestible for me with the very busy schedule that I carry in my practice. So this type of structure helps me and you need to find, means that you need to find the strategy and breakdown that works best for you. The second strategy and productivity hack is keep the task small. So the hardest part of getting work done is just starting, right? Just getting to your desk and like, okay, I'm ready to start doing this. One of my favorite work hacks that addresses this issue is the evidence-based Pomodoro technique. So how this technique works is very simple, is that you work in 25 minute blocks, each separated by five minute breaks. During each work block, you focus on just one small task on your list. So this technique increases our expectancy. If I sit down to work and told myself, oh, this project is gonna take five hours, what do you think is gonna happen, right? I would definitely get distracted right away. I would avoid the task altogether. This happens often. But if I told myself, I just have to sit down and work for 25 minutes on this one thing, on this one email, one little task, it becomes much less daunting and much easier, not only to get started, but also to stay focused. Additionally, if you have kids and also for yourself, I wanna recommend brain breaks. So brain breaks are quick activities that get your blood pumping, your body moving, and wake up our brains. These activities not only help you support emotion regulation, but also regain focus during school and work days. Okay, I'll include a sample of brain breaks as well as a really cute like brain break bingo game that you can play with a die um, at the end of the presentation in your resources section for you so that you have examples of that. Next, it's really important to set the bar 
low, low, low. This is another trick to ex increase expectancy in our equation. So set the bar to something less than what you're actually capable of. So I've used this recently with my own um, exercise practice, loose quotations on that. Um, when I set out to work out 30 to 45 minutes every day, I only get around to doing it maybe once per week. I'm being so generous with myself right now and sometimes zero days a week, right? Um, it felt like I never had the chunk of time to dedicate to it. I could always be working on something else. Um, I just never did it. So I rarely exercised. Instead, I lowered my expectations by aiming to exercise just five minutes every other day. By lowering the bar, I found myself exercising more and also able to exercise for longer periods of time, even though I set the goal to five minutes. Because this is a biohack, guys, because I was already on the treadmill and I, I tell myself constantly, I can do anything for five minutes. I can do anything for five minutes. This is also, side note, it's also called the depression rule, right? So for some of my clients that are battling depression um, and depression really takes energy away from us, I let them know the thing that depression is telling you that you can't do, like go outside for a walk, go do something with a friend, you tell yourself, I'm just gonna do it for five minutes. Because in our brain, we feel I can do anything for five minutes. And that precedes action, precedes action. So that's a way of really getting you going. And the really hard part of engaging in activity is starting. So this is a really great way to do that, okay? Let's talk about my favorite one of these productivity hacks, which is hacking pleasure from working or studying. So sometimes our priorities are a little bit unclear, right? If we've been working on a project for long periods of time, we don't know when it's gonna end. We don't know when we're gonna be rewarded, whether it's that commission or whether it's like, um, you know, the meeting with the client or for our kids when the semester or the quarter is gonna end. Um, these all point to experiencing really low value in our productivity equation. Therefore, increasing value will help us overcome procrastination. So that one way is to give yourself a reward for completing the task. For example, you can reward yourself with a new recipe for dinner to change things up or hanging out with a friend. And this also adds accountability to the equation because when your friend or spouse expects you at 5 p.m. to get coffee together or go for a walk, you need to get the task done to show up. So that also helps hack like engagement and motivation to start. In addition, a biohack that I use in my practice and it's part of behavioral therapy um, is to be mindful of how you're talking to yourself and your children about their goals. So if we say, if I don't get this presentation done, then I won't watch my favorite show tonight. Or if you don't clean your room, then you won't play video games. You're subconsciously letting yourself and your children potentially know that it's a choice, A, and that the, and it's a potential threat, right? If you don't do this, then you won't get that. So if you change the language just to when, like when you pick up your clothes from the floor, then you get to hang out with your friend, then we've added expectation and accountability, um, which helps us engage more effectively. And it's a lot kinder way to not only talk to ourselves, team members and our children as well. Our fifth productivity hack is called use your Parkinson's law. So Parkinson's law um, is a research-based strategy once more. And that idea is that we only, we can complete a task. Let me come back to it, hold on. So the idea that you can complete a task at a later time can crush even the most productive people that I've seen, right? So Parkinson's law states that work expands to fill the allotted time you've given to it. So this means that if you only have, a, if you only have work that would take 30 minutes to do, but you schedule two hours of work to complete it, you'll end up spending those two hours with this kind of diluted 
work energy. You'll check your emails, you'll come back to the project. You will, you know, talk to your spouse and then come back to it. You will do other things. I have two hours to do it. So I'm going to expand the work to the two hours I've given it. So the strategy for this is to set artificial deadlines when you create deadlines that force you to get work done more efficiently. If you have work that takes 30 minutes, only schedule a 30 minute block to get that done. And this is also where Pomodoro can give you um, additional support. Um, and I didn't mention that Pomodoro, there are apps that help you with Pomodoro that just pop up um, on your laptop or even on your phone and let you know it's time to focus or it's time to take a break. So make use of that, the app store, you can just put Pomodoro. There's also a focus timer that's really helpful too, okay? So coming back to this, these artificial deadlines decrease delay in our motivation equation. Therefore, it decreases the likelihood of procrastination. And I recommend you not be too aggressive or rigid with your timelines as that can lead to unnecessary stress. So with time, you'll get better at gauging how long a task will take either for work, for helping your children, for doing different things. And one of the things that I do in my practice is that I recommend that we time ourselves completing daily tasks. It's so interesting how our brain will usually kind of catastrophize and blow things up, especially if we're tired, stressed, or, you know, just having a hard time in general. It'll tell you, I don't have time to do the dishes tonight. It's too much. Or I don't have time to cook. We have to order something. So I asked my clients to, I want you to like spend a day just timing and writing down how long does it actually take you to do the dishes? Some of them are surprised to say like, wow, it took me six minutes. And I thought in my brain, it was going to be 45 minutes, right? How long does it take you to make the bed in the morning? How long does it take you to take a shower and get ready? How long does it take you to actually put away the laundry, which is one of my toughest tasks in life. Um, I, my brain always says like, no, that's gonna take up the whole day. And timing it lets you know that you have an accurate account and data of like, I know it's gonna take me 45 minutes. You can use your Parkinson's law to your advantage. You carve out time for 45 minutes and I'm done with that task, okay? We can all agree that one of the biggest productivity killers is distractions right? Avoiding distractions through sheer willpower, even though like, God bless, I know we're all trying, is really unlikely to be effective long term. So rather, I recommend that you take a preventative approach. The first step is creating a work environment that minimizes distractions. So if you declutter your desk, um, when you are thinking about your work environment, we want to decrease kind of the impulsivity part of the equation, right? So decluttering your desk means when your desk feels like full of things or post-its or things that you need to do, it's subconsciously constantly pulling our attention and also shaming us a little bit, right? That you need to be doing something else as well as this. So you always feel a little bit cognitively drained. So that's first step. Placing your phone on airplane mode when you're working is really helpful because research shows that that ding that comes up, whether it's a text message or it's you know a new news alert, as we're all hyper-focused on those right now, it takes an average of seven minutes to get you back to the focus that you were before you got distracted. Imagine how those seven minutes really accumulate over time for you. So be mindful of that and prevent, prevent the distraction from pulling you from what's happening in that moment. There's also technology is such an ally um, where you can place your computer on do not disturb mode as well. I recommend using full screens to focus on just one task at hand instead of multiple open tabs or sometimes like multiple screens that we're working on. Location is really tough right now uh, in terms of options, right? A lot of us are working from home and um, there are some ways to work around this with the use of room dividers. So 
this behind me, uh, this beautiful painting is a room divider that has like different um, paintings on each side. It's a way to create a little bit of privacy and space on my desk um, and just make this the desk area and I'm not distracted by what might be happening on the other side of that screen. If some of you have the blessing of having a an office that you can work in. I often work with my, in my practice and we have, especially for kids, if you have kids, I have like a, a lighting system. So kind of like a traffic light. If mom or dad are working, red means there's no knocking. This is a full productivity mode, like full focus. Yellow means come if it's something really important. And then they you know, either put a magnet on the color that they need to, and green means come on in. It's great. It's fine. So this allows also for our kids to understand when we need to have the boundaries of separation um, and work and when it's okay to come in. So it heightens the clarity around that as well. For kids, uh, instead of this type of divider, which also works for them, I also recommend the three-sided poster boards on their desk, which also eliminates a lot of the visual distractions around them because their environment can really pull their attention as well. I have some of my kids decorate it like with stars in the sky, nothing too cluttered because I don't want the board to distract them as well, but make it their own and that really helps as well. Also use tech to your advantage, guys. There are programs like Stay Focused, which I've included the name here, and also Freedom that will block distracting sites for the periods of times that you ask it to. So even if you try to get into Facebook, it'll be like, not now, you gotta wait, you gotta do what you gotta do. So favorite topic, let's talk about positive emotions. So two of the main it, most important positive emotions are gratitude and hope. They call these like the Mac daddies of positive emotions because they actually lead to other positive emotions like joy, love, satisfaction. If we work on this one, all these other ones really trickle down over time. Okay, so gratitude is a thankful appreciation for something you receive, it can be tangible like a gift or it can be someone's time. Um, so intangible or tangible. And with gratitude, it, it allows people to acknowledge the goodness in their lives. So I always teach my coaching clients about what's going on up here. Our brain is meant for survival. So that means that it's constantly scanning the environment for danger. So it makes sense that sometimes, especially during tough times and in prolonged periods of tough times, our brain is constantly looking for what I gotta do, what's wrong, what's the next task, because that's our primitive brain. It wants to keep us safe. Gratitude is a great counteraction. I call it a biohack of overriding that mental filter that happens all the time. And that's natural to happen. So it helps you acknowledge what's going right in our lives. Rarely do we sit down and be like, huh, uh, it's, I love that I have this house and I'm safe and all my family members are okay. And I was able to go on a walk today. Like that's not really how our brain works. So we can be proactive in order to build that. One myth that most of us believe is that people are either born happy, grateful, hopeful, or they're not, right? It's like, oh, that's a personality thing. That's a temperament thing. But years and years of research in positive psychology and cognitive behavioral therapy show that these are muscles that we build over time, that there are skills and activities that you can engage in in order to increase these positive emotions in your life. It's not something that you're stuck without. It's just something you have to build. And I love teaching these skills to my kids um, at a young age, right? My young clients, because these are really protective over time in order to protect and buffer them from anxiety, mood disorders, and so forth, okay? So benefits, let's talk about benefits because this adds to our motivation equation, right? If I don't give you good reasons to do it, usually our brain's gonna be like, well, what's the point? So benefits of gratitude um, that have been studied are that it improves our relationships because we're able to see, you know, not only the things that that person has done for you, you acknowledge them and it makes intimacy stronger. 
not only in friendships, but as well as partnerships. Uh, it improves our physical health. There are longitudinal studies that show that people that are more grateful experience less pain. They've studied people with chronic pain that see pain reduce over time. It improves your psychological health, right? There's less anxiety, depression in people that are more grateful. It also, a really interesting um, study came out recently where it really enhances it reduces aggression, right? It's almost a buffer against aggression because even when you're mad, you're able to see like, well, that person did that to me, but gosh, they've been so helpful in the past. And you're able to see a more holistic picture of the people around you, right? Grateful people also sleep better. I don't know how well that's connected, but if you're more grateful, I guess you're more at ease and not just thinking about the things that are not going right, okay? and it also improves our self-esteem. So let's talk about how to increase gratitude. I think I sold it. It's really important. Um, the best strategy out there that's really simple because I'm really into like biohacks, life hacks is the three good things strategy. And you can make this work for your family in any way. It's better to do it daily and consistently, right? Where um, you talk about what are three things that went well today. And I always recommend to pair it with a routine that you're already doing. I've done this with my work teams where I've created grateful mornings. As soon as we get together in the morning, we talk about what are you grateful or looking forward to today? So we start the day off on the right foot. I've done this with families where I ask them at dinner time, go around the table. Everyone share three things that they're grateful for. Um, I've also recommended doing it on daily walks while you're walking, okay, what are three things that we feel grateful for? Pair it to something you're already doing because this attaches the habit and it allows it to stick more over time, okay? Three good things. Now let's talk about hope. So hope is a desire with a belief for something. Basically all it is, I want something, I believe I'm gonna have it, and that creates hope. Okay, so there's this expectation that comes with something that you want. And that's really important to build. And again, like a muscle, we need to build hope, especially during times like this. We need to be really um, active in figuring out how can I increase this in my kids and my family and my team. Um, so let's talk about the benefits next. Hope reduces physical pain, just like gratitude just like gratitude does. So they've seen migraine sufferers suffer from less migraines, chronic pain, reduced chronic pain over time. I love this particular, it's a pretty new study where they found that having high hope levels boosts your circulation and improves your respiration system, uh, your respiratory system, which yes, please, like we're all mindful of COVID. And if it can improve the way that I breathe and my lung function, Let's do that. Um, and also, there's another study that showed that optimism improves your ca cardiovascular health. Um, so very, very protective, positive emotion. So how do we increase it? Is always viewing and talking about, OK, challenges or opportunities. How is this challenge that we're facing? as a company, as an individual, as a couple, as a family? How is it an opportunity for us to change things up? How is it an opportunity for us to grow stronger together or be more successful? Viewing, and I always teach the kids that I work with, mistakes are so helpful, right? If there's a setback, that's an opportunity for a comeback somehow. How can we see this and be hopeful that next time around, we're gonna do it even better? An additional evidence-based strategy is called the best possible selves activity. So you can do this for yourself. You can also do it with your kids or even as a team. And I recommend doing this a couple of times a year sometimes. Imagine where you prompt and think about, imagine yourself in the future. Everything turned out as well as possible, right? This is a time to dream, guys. Dream big. On a piece of paper, you can write about it, or for younger kids, you can draw what that might be like. Be super specific. Imagine what you might look like, things that you'll accomplish, places you'll go, what it might feel like. It's really helpful to put like 
I'm going to feel happy. I'm going to feel confident. I'm going to feel satisfied and be as creative and imaginative as possible as you want. Because this builds again in our mind, the possibilities and it expands our vision from survival to things that I would want to accomplish. And that allows for a more holistic view of yourself now and in the future. So best possible selves, great strategy to have and engage with. Let's talk about self-care. We've all been hearing a lot about self-care um, in order to protect ourselves during hard times. So I want to provide some steps for self-care. Um, and the ones that I usually really focus on is we have to build a community of support. As humans, we're incredibly social creatures. We're not meant to be isolated or away from our families. And these are really trying times that that's what the community, the government requires of us, right? But we can still build communities of support in other ways. I've seen really beautiful connections happen where people find like-minded people through Facebook groups or meetups um, where they do physically distance hikes when the weather is nice and things like that. So find and build a community, even it might be a digital community, but having that makes us feel less alone, which makes allows us to feel more comfortable um, and feeling like, okay, I have people that I can go to um, and we're not going through this by ourselves. Delegate, delegate, delegate. And my most ambitious clients, I see that they want to do it all. Um, and it's really one of the main um, removers of resources to not delegate. Have trusted people in your neighborhood, in your family, within like your work teams and delegate tasks in order to feel like, okay, my resources are low right now. This is how I can get this task done and allow for everyone, it takes, it truly does take a village to take on some things that might be helpful to me. Restorative activities. I know we've all heard about the bubble baths or, you know, the watching TV for a while or maybe the glass of wine. But I wanna talk about that there are other categories of self-care that are not necessarily buzzwords in our community. So we'll talk about next different categories of self-care that we should also be mindful of. And then physical activity. We cannot get away from this one, guys. Um, I didn't put exercise on this slide specifically because that can be a really triggering word for a lot of people, myself included. It's just about movement. Our body does need movement in order to process emotion, in order to process like thoughts and, and figure out things to do. We have to move in order to also, it creates these um, hormones in our brain like oxytocin and um, endorphins that allow us to feel better. It doesn't have to be going to the gym. It can be taking a call and pacing around the room. It can be going for a walk, of course. It can be riding your bike. It can be a dance party with your family. It's just about movement. So now let's increase a little bit of motivation for self-care because that is really, I'm always mindful of the equation and helping you kind of have these things stick. In the olden times when we were on planes <laughs> and someday we'll be back here, uh, they would tell parents, you have to put the mask on yourself first before you put it on your child, right? Why? Because if you're not okay, people around you are not gonna be okay. We cannot pour from an empty cup. And we're constantly having our resources pulled and pulled and pulled. And if we're not pouring back in, we won't have enough to give. Right? So this is really about survival. Self-care should be part of the equation because it's necessary to keep going. And I think I often see that sometimes people feel like self-care is a luxury when it's actually medicine and necessary. So think about that when you're incorporating this into your life. All right, so the wonderful Dr. Phoenix, she's a trauma specialist, put together this self-care wheel that's more holistic and encompassing of all the different areas of self-care that we should be mindful of. Usually what our mind goes to is physical self-care. Gotta sleep, gotta eat, 
got to exercise, right? There's more to it than that, guys. We have, we're a complete human being that needs more than just that. We have psychological self-care. Um, I'm going to be looking over here because I see it a little bit bigger than on this screen. Where our psychological self-care is, if I need to go talk to someone, there's tons of great resources of therapists that you can see via Zoom or even apps that you can go to to talk and process emotion. Um, reading self-help books, joining support groups virtually, that would take care of our psychological self-care, right? Our emotional self-care involves more so um, having like laughing, having social interactions with your friends that are physically distanced, of course, um, having, letting the people that you know, that you love know that you love them. There are needs that you have in your emotional self-care bucket that need to be filled. So these are all ideas that can go into that as well. Our spiritual self-care, I want you to be mindful, this is not necessarily religion related. It's more so about um, getting to know yourself and the things that bring you peace, right? So if being in nature is one of those things, if meditating is, it's finding things that inspire you, really fill up your spiritual bucket. Then we have our personal one. So this is something that often I see kind of like go by the wayside. It's, hey, I established these goals five years ago. What are my goals now? Those are constantly changing as we're growing and developing as people. Um, do Am I single and I want to start going on dates? That's part of my personal self-care. Um, what are the things? What are my short-term, long-term goals? What do I want out of life? Those conversations and attention to that fills up your personal self-care bucket. And then professional, right? We're all professionals here and we have to figure out, okay, am I setting the boundaries that I need around work? Am I saying no when I need to? Am I taking lunch breaks? Am I using, you know, my vacation days when I can? Um, am I, you know, being able to be the best team mate that I can be because I'm addressing my professional self-care needs and not leading to burnout? Okay. I recommend that you take a look at this wheel and I'd love for you to give yourself a rating for each one. So I always tell my coaching clients from one to 10, one is like, I'm not doing any of this. 10 is like, I'm rocking it. Give yourself a rating on a scale of one to 10 and see which ones are low for you to then be intentional about the activities that you should incorporate into your life. All right, I put together this self-care challenge for you guys. So it, it adds a little bit of accountability. It's fun. You can change up the activities if you need to, but just some ideas, maybe the first day you wear something you love, um, another day you go for a walk, but you're being mindful of what's something, just one thing that I'm gonna do as part of my self-care challenge. And it's also helpful to do that with your partner, with your team and with your family as well. All right. I wanted to give you more resources in terms of activities that you can do with your family that encompass all these different areas of self-care and how to take care of that. Let's say our physical self-care as a family, let's do a dance party. Um, our mental self-care together, we're going to do like a meditation together or practice belly breathing, for example. So you have this to have tons of ideas there too. All right. Winter is coming in in some places, it's a little bit colder than others. Uh, so I wanted to be mindful of not only providing kind of an example of how can we get more physical activity throughout the day if we have to be indoors. So they have these great treadmill pads available. And this is an example of my standing desk that I'm in right now. Um, standing desks are helpful because sitting throughout the day um, it can really impact our health and also our energy throughout the day. And then getting some movement, especially in the months where we won't be able to get outside as much. Um, this is an example of what that might look like. All right, guys, I want to, as you can tell, obsessed with resources. Uh, I wanted to give you apps because I wish I could be a coach in your pocket. Uh, these are some of my favorite apps. All of them are free. Uh, first one is Insight Timer. And in particular, I really love Be Calm by Tom Evans. If you're having a hard time, pop in your headphones, listen to Be Calm by Tom Evans. And he gives you really great evidence-based strategies on how to soothe your system. Nothing Here by You might Nothing Here But You by Muji is fantastic as well. Smiling Mind is a great app to teach you mindfulness skills. 
Okay, so in particular, I love the Thrive Inside program and sleep program from adults and kids if you're having trouble sleeping. And Anti-Stress is a really fun app with little activities that you can do just to get your mind off things and then come back to work during those breaks. All right, how do we make these habits stick? Uh, research shows that it takes an average of 66 days or 66 uh, times that you do a new behavior to for it to become automatic, right? It's around that range. So first, we need to be intentional. Ask yourself, why is this important to me? I always ask my clients to identify their why. Without knowing your why, we won't really feel attached to the outcome. Making making that why very clear uh, is helpful. Put a post-it note on your laptop. Discuss it, you know, talk about it in the morning as soon as you wake up, your three good things plus what's my why today is helpful to keep you on track. Second, creating a routine is really helpful. Uh, scheduling routines allows us to feel more in control and it allows for consistency. Consistency makes us feel safe. Um, so make sure that your schedule is one that really works for you, right? When you tell yourself, I'm going to go to the gym at 6 a.m. every day, that might not be very realistic. So Try things out and make sure they're realistic for you. Routinely ask yourself, what is this particular habit adding to my life to acknowledge its value and increase motivation? For example, every time I go to the gym, I'm supporting my sleep hygiene and overall health. That allows you to feel more attached to the habit and keep going. And reminders are your friends. Use your phone timers, Alexa, Google Homes, just to set it and forget it give you reminders of the things that you need to be doing. And this really helps track our habits and help us engage. And lastly, track your progress. This is like pure behavioral therapy as well. And I'm mindful of the time, Rebecca, thank you. Um, where if it's something that you're doing, tracking it in a calendar, putting stickers on a calendar is really helpful. Not wanting to break the chain is really motivating as human beings. And I'm a comedy geek, um, so Jerry Seinfeld has often said that he doesn't go a day without writing a joke, and he has like a special notebook for it, and he doesn't want to lose his streak, and he attributes a lot of his success to this consistent practice. Thank you so much for your time and attention, and I know I went over a little bit, but we have time for questions, and also the rest of the presentation is going to be resources for you. You know, at this point, we've just had a few people hoping to get a, uh, the slides for them to keep, which we will definitely do, but I have not had any questions yet. Um, so if anyone has any, um, you're welcome to send them now. Um, but uh, Dr. Sylvie, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we really appreciate you providing us these tools for, for success uh, and how to live by them. Um, uh, again, if you would like to review this or the slides, they'll be posted on our website. Uh, our site is beconet.com forward slash flourish, where you can view this fantastic webinar along with our others uh, on the green room. Um, and it looks like nothing else has come through. So Dr. Sylvie, thank you so much for your time. Uh, we really appreciate it. And uh, I think we're all I'm so grateful. A little self-care on the way for us all. Definitely. Thank you. <laughs>